great man with us tonight who, uh, in the third grade, um, he passed his eye exam. And um, in uh, 1979, uh, he was a spelling bee champ for all of Anna local schools. And uh, in 1985, he was crowned as the Shelby County Junior Fair King. And you may know him as Father Dan Schmidtmeyer, Vocation Director for the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. So why don't you guys give him a warm welcome. because so many times I want to talk about degrees and all those things. I'm like, really? That's what people need to know about me. <laughs> the important stuff. The fact that I was the fair king was so important. <laughs> Tonight I'm, I'm humbled to be with you, to talk with you. And earlier this week, one of my sisters called. I've got three older sisters. One called and said, hey, what are you doing this weekend? Usually my answer is hearing confessions and going to ma or setting mass. I said, oh, I'm going to talk for this youth retreat. It's a wonderful. Um, I said, now, I've gone to the first three of this year because I was in Sydney up north before, so I wasn't able to come. And I said, and I knew I was going the fourth one. And I kept hearing these keynote speakers, and they've been outstanding. They have been great. They've been wonderful. And the petty part of me was saying, I was really hoping one of them maybe wouldn't be so good. <laughs> Because it would make it easier for me then. I could just come up and say, hey, how's it going? And I wouldn't be so pressured to do such a great job. But bottom line, it's not me. The Holy Spirit's going to take care of all that. But I told her, I was so interested. Oh, what's your talk about? I said, oh, they, they gave me, they said, be holy because I am holy. And there was silence. I said, but you're not holy. <laughs> I said, oh. It's not I am holy like I am holy. It's I am holy like God is holy. So that's what we're called to is to be holy because I am holy. Be holy because God is holy. But you see, she's known me my whole life. So she knows me very well. And she knows that I'm a fast food kind of guy. Okay? I mean, it might be obvious. But I love fast food because it's fast. You know, the worst thing, one of the worst things is going through a drive through at a fast food restaurant, and you have to wait. <laughs> or they say, pull ahead, your food will be ready soon. I'm like, I just want my Big Mac and fries, and I want it now. <laughs> if I wanted to wait, I would have come earlier. I want this food now, and, and I've been like this my whole life. My best friend, we've been best friends since we were five years old. And he always thought it was hilarious because if I was driving somewhere, he knew I hated red lights. Because I would turn right on red, even if I had to turn left, because that way I wouldn't have to wait. You know, I'm the guy who stands in front of the microwave oven and yells, hurry, because I'm so hungry, I want to eat. But you see, that's probably the reason I struggled with the whole idea of growing in holiness for my whole life. Because you see, faith, holiness, it's not a fast food type of thing. It takes a while. It takes us our whole lives. <clears throat> and so I know when I was in high school and when I was thinking about all these things, I started questioning, is being holy really something I want to do? And that's something we have to ask ourselves. Is being holy something I really want to do? And we know, of course, the answer we're supposed to say is yes, right? Yes, I want to be holy. Of course I want to be holy. We hear this throughout sacred scripture. We saw it earlier, and Matt was talking about it earlier, from Peter. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Live soberly and set your hopes completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Like obedient children, do not act in compliance with the desires of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, be yourselves holy in every aspect of your conduct. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. And we also hear this from the Old Testament, from Leviticus and Exodus. You are to be my holy people. We hear from Matthew's gospel, be perfect for your father in heaven is perfect. But just because we know that we're called to be holy, 
it doesn't automatically follow that we're going to live that life. And I was blessed. My closest friends to this day are friends I made when I was in kindergarten. We went all the way from kindergarten through high school together, 25 to 30 of us. We still get together, have great times. And my friends are incredible people. They're good people. And a lot of them, when we were in high school, were really holy. They were really good. And I was the kid. I always liked to tell jokes. I always liked to make people laugh. And when I was in high school, the way I did it was by saying things very inappropriate, kind of risque, the dirty jokes, the bad stuff you're supposed to say, kind of shocking. And I remember I said one thing, and I can't remember what it was, which I think is a good thing, but it was nasty. I mean, it was awful. My one friend came up to me and said, Dan, that's not cool. That's not who you should be. That's not a good thing. You shouldn't do that. He was a true friend. He was trying to help me. Do you know what I said to him? I looked at him and I said, don't push your morals off on me. I'm not going to be like that. I don't want to be like you. I wasn't ready because I wasn't ready to listen. I didn't know what holiness looked like. I said the words. I went to Mass every Sunday. I prayed. But I wasn't friends with Jesus. I hadn't truly encountered Jesus. I didn't really spend time with him. I said my prayers, I said them quick, I got them over with. And so it took a while for me to figure out what that meant. And as I was starting my passage into trying to be a better person, to be a person of faith, to live a holy life, it was challenging. Because what does holiness look like? To be holy, do we all have to be exactly the same? Does that mean that we should all be exactly like Mother Teresa or Pope Francis or St. John Paul II? Does that mean we have to be cookie cutter exactly the same? And so I wasn't sure what it looked like. But my freshman year of college, an amazing thing happened. My older sister, Barb, had the first grandchild in my family. And we were so excited. There's six kids in my family. I'm the second youngest, so my mom still calls me one of the little boys. <laughs> I'm six foot six. <laughs> like, yes, mom, I'm one of your little boys. But my sister Barb asked me to be the godfather for her first child, my niece Danielle. I was so honored. So honored. And I read about what a godfather's supposed to do. And that's a pretty big deal. It's a pretty serious thing. You promised to help raise this child in the faith. And I thought, I don't know my faith. I've got to learn about my faith. I've got to learn about Jesus for myself. Not because mom and dad say you have to go to Mass. I've got to do this on my own. And I started going to Mass every day. I started reading the Bible. I started doing everything I could. Praying the rosary. All these things. And I was starting to become friends with Jesus. With God. With the Holy Spirit. And things were moving pretty good. But I wasn't prepared for the devil attacking. You see, that's what the devil does. Usually it's pretty subtle. Usually it's pretty small. Sometimes it's huge things. I wasn't prepared. I wasn't ready for the devil to attack me. For the devil to try to bring me back. And so, when my niece was 18 months old, she died. Very suddenly. And I was heartbroken. And I didn't have the relationship with God, with Jesus, that I thought I did. And so right away, I was mad at God. And I said, I, I was thinking about being a priest at that time. And of course I said, I'm never going to be a priest. So, yeah, don't say never to God because he'll laugh at you really hard. <laughs> but I said, I'm not going to do this. And so I thought everything. But the amazing thing about God, he never gives up on us. He invites us every single day to grow in holiness. He invites us every single day to have faith. He invites us every single day to be his friend. God is so persistent. I am so stubborn. So I kept ignoring the invitation. I kept saying no. 
I kept saying, this is not going to happen. But God is so persistent, he kept calling me. He kept calling me and he kept calling me. And eventually, I knew I had to give in. And so I started having another conversion, similar to the one when I became Daniel's godfather. I started to become friends with God. And I started asking myself the question, will I go to heaven? Will I go to heaven? That should be our number one goal. That should be what we're aiming for. We should be going to heaven. And in prayer, I realized the answer was no. I wasn't going to go to heaven. Not the way I was living. Not the things I was doing. Not the way I treated people. I was not going to be going. Say that again. <laughs> I'm hoping I'm on the way to heaven now. Um, but it was a slow growth in faith then. A slow growth of learning about the faith. And one of the most helpful things that happened, I was uh, reading the Bible. I had this beautiful study Bible. And in the back of some study Bibles, you'll see they've got maps. I don't know if any of you have ever seen the maps in the back of the Bible. I saw the map of the Exodus. When... Moses led the Jewish people from Egypt to the promised land, okay? It should take two weeks walking to get there. It took them 40 years. I saw this map. Straight line should be how you get there. The map showed their track. 40 years, they're walking all over the place. I realized the 40 years represented one life. That's my life of faith. That's all of our lives of faith. There are times we're walking with Jesus. We're walking right where he wants us to go. There are times Jesus walking that way. And it's like, hey, I'm going over this way. You should come with me. It'll be really neat. We should always be walking with Jesus. But our lives are like that. We're all over the place. We get stronger. We get weak. But we need to remember as we're living this life, that we're called to holiness because we want to go to heaven. We're called to holiness because we want to be saints. We love God and we want to be with God. Now part of this, one of the things that helps us, because God doesn't make us do it on our own. Okay, be holy, see you later. No, he gives us so much help. He gives us the church. But often you can tell what a person is like by the people they hang out with. The people who are their friends. You can see what kind of person they are. In uh, the letter to Hebrews, St. Paul says, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider how their lives ended and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teaching. We spend time with our friends who are leading us in the right direction. When Benedict was named Pope, I read this interview by him. He was asked, how do you pray? How do you pray? And he said, well, obviously the Mass is the most important thing I do every day. Praying the office is very important. The rosary, spending time with Mary. He said, but... My day is never complete. My day is never right if I don't spend a little time with my two best friends. And I said, oh, who are your two best friends? And he said, St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Augustine. If I don't spend time with those two every day, talking about what I'm going through, telling them about my life, asking for their intercession, asking for their help, it's not a good day. And I'd never thought of making a saint a friend before. I'd never thought of that. I'm like, that is beautiful. And I started thinking, and at this point, um, I was close to being ordained. I was in the seminary, and I started thinking, okay, I want to find a saint who can be a friend, who can understand me, who can help me. And the first saint I turned to was St. Peter, our first pope. And I didn't turn to him because he was our first pope. I don't have aspirations or goals or hopes that someday I'll be a bishop or pope. I want to just kind of be shoved off to the side, let me be a priest. 
But I chose St. Peter because in sacred scripture, we hear that St. Peter is kind of a bonehead. <laughs> right? He always says stupid stuff. And that's just like me. And I love that about St. Peter. You know, St. Peter is the first one to identify Jesus as the Christ. And Jesus tells him, I am going to be tortured. I am going to be killed. And St. Peter says, oh no, Jesus, we can't let you do that. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You're thinking as man and not as I do. A couple of weeks ago for the gospel, for Sunday Mass, we heard of the transfiguration. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John to the top of a mountain. He is transfigured before them. He is dazzling white. Moses and Elisha, who have been dead for centuries, join them. And they're speaking with Jesus. And Peter comes up, Jesus, it's good we're here. Let me put up three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And then it says, he was so nervous he didn't know what he was saying. <laughs> and you can just about imagine Jesus' face when he's looking at Peter going. <laughs> Jesus says nothing. A voice from heaven, God the Father speaks from heaven and says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Shut up, Peter. <laughs> Listen to my boy. He's got things to tell you. And so I love St. Peter. Because that's me. That's who I am. I'm the bonehead who says the stupid stuff. I'm the one who doesn't think and just goes and does something. And so St. Peter is my friend and he helps me. And then after I was ordained a priest, and I'd been a pastor for about two years, and it's really tough being a pastor. It's wonderful. It's incredible. It's fun. But it's also really difficult because you could work 24 hours a day and not get everything done you need to do and you want to do for your people, for your children. And I remember it had been about two years in, and I was struggling. And I realized I wasn't praying the way I should. I mean, I was saying Mass every day. I was doing my office every day. But I wasn't praying. I wasn't spending time with my friend Jesus the way I should. I wasn't listening to what Jesus had to say. And I started thinking, maybe God is calling me to monastic life. Maybe I should leave being a parish priest, become a monk, so I can spend all day in prayer, praying for all the people in the world, and praying for my salvation. Because that's a wonderful life. And when people are called to that life, they live incredible lives. And I've been called a monastery to see if I could schedule a time to visit. Now, because of the way my schedule was set up, I had to wait 18 months before I could go because I couldn't find a whole week to go away from the parish. But Lent had started, and I started praying more and reading, and I was reading the life of St. John Vianney, who is my current best friend, Saint. St. John Vianney is the patron saint for parish priest. Three times he tried to leave his parish in Ars, France to become a monk. One time he even got to the monastery before the people from Ars went to the monastery and drug him back <laughs> to the parish, kicking and screaming. And he was going there because he didn't have time to pray the way he needed to pray for his own salvation. And he went back to the parish, and he made it part of his schedule. He was one of those priests who would spend 17, 18 hours a day in the confessional. And so sometimes to pray the way he needed to, he would make the penitent stay while he prayed his office. And I realized, I don't need to be a monk. That's not who God's calling me to be. God's called me to be a parish priest. I need to learn from my friend, St. John Vianney, who I need to be. But one of the keys with all of this is that as we're trying to grow, as we're trying to learn how to be holy, as we're trying to grow in our faith, and we have these great saint friends, and we have great friends in our classes, and in our schools, and in our families, we have to be careful not to fall into the trap of thinking, I've got to be just like them. I need to be just like this person because they're holy. That's how I have to be. When I was in the seminary, I read the life story of St. Teresa 
or St. Therese of Lisieux, the little flower. Beautiful story, the story of a soul. Everyone should read the story. But I got finished reading it, and I was depressed. And one of the priests at the seminary said, Dan, why do you look so depressed? I'm like, I just finished story of a soul. And he's like, that's usually pretty uplifting. I said, yeah, it was great. I said, but I'm never going to be like that. But he looked at me and said, that's good. She was a 24-year-old nun. <laughs> you should not be a 24-year-old nun. You are not being called to be St. Therese of Lisieux. You are being called to be St. Dan Schmidtmeier. That's who you're called to be. Be who you are. And I realized that was so important in my whole life, my whole being a, as a priest. Because when I was growing up, the priests, all the priests I knew in the northern part of the diocese were really old. Great, great holy men, but they rarely smiled. And I was so nervous about getting ordained because I smile all the time. <laughs> and I tell the dorkiest jokes over and over and over again. I don't care if I've told you this joke 25 times. I am going to tell it to you again, and I'm going to laugh really hard. Because <laughs> I think it's awesome. And I realized that's who God was calling to be a priest. He was calling me to be a priest. He was calling me to be holy. He was calling me to be his friend. Who I am. Not to be someone else. Now that doesn't mean we shouldn't be changing. We need to change. We need to grow in faith and grow in holiness. Sometimes we have to go away from things we've done. Bad habits we've picked up. Because it's keeping us from holiness. But we can't be someone we're not. And so one of the keys of growing in holiness is to grow in the virtue of humility. Now, the virtue of humility, just so you know, stinks. Okay? It is hard. It is the hardest virtue to develop because the virtue of humility fights the sin of pride. Pride is the root of all sin. So humility is really, really hard. And it's something that will never get 100% right. I think it was Ren and Stimpy, I can't remember which cartoon, but the one said, when it comes to being humble, I'm the greatest. <laughs> because as soon as we think we're humble, we're not. But one of the key things with humility that people confuse all the time is in order to be humble, I need to put myself down. Somebody will come up, hey, you did a great job. Oh, no, no, I'm no good at that. Hey, you looked really good tonight. Oh, no, this old thing is nothing. That's nothing. No, true humility is being 100% honest. 100% yes. God made me good. He gave me talents and skills. I have weaknesses. But we can't ignore the talents and skills because we're then telling God that he made junk. But we have to grow in this virtue of humility. We have to accept the fact that God made us very good. God made us to be saints. God loves us and he wants to be our best friend. And so we have to pray for this virtue. We have to listen to Jesus. We have to spend time asking ourselves, what is it that tempts me to sin? What is it that keeps me from being the holy person God called me to be? What are the things God gave me that helps me grow in holiness? How are ways I can grow? What are things I can do that help me become a saint? God made us for heaven. God sent his son Jesus Christ to earth for us to live for us, to love for us, to die for us. Jesus gave us the church. He gave us his body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist so we can be with him, so we can receive him, so we can become what we receive. He wants to be our best friend. He wants to be with us. He doesn't 
ever turn away from us, but we turn away from Him. And so we need to spend time getting to know our friend Jesus, spending time with Him. Tonight, you've got that great opportunity. Jesus will be here. Jesus is here right now. And we get to spend time adoring Him. That's such a rare thing. We don't have time to do that in our world usually. We don't adore people. We adore God. But even with that, sometimes we struggle with that thought. But we have that opportunity. And we get this opportunity over and over again. We have the opportunity to go to Mass, to pray, to go to confession, to confess those times when we've fallen because we know He's going to keep lifting us up. God's calling each one of you to be holy. He's saying to you in your heart, be holy because I am holy. He is inviting you to love Him completely. He is inviting you to be a saint. Are you ready to accept that invitation? Let's stand and pray. Our good and great friend, Jesus, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for creating us. We thank you for inviting us to be your friend. Rain your blessing down upon us. Give us the strength we need so we can be the people you made us to be, so we can grow in holiness and lead others to be holy as well. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you. And in your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>